That was weird. Oh well. Grey Dawn, with an A, not with an E. Grey Dawn is a religious first-person horror adventure game from Romanian indie developer Interactive Stone. In September of 2015, the fledgling developer would post a Kickstarter for $56,000 to fund the development of Grey Dawn, with stretch goals like a soundtrack performed by a full orchestra. A month would pass with the project accruing just below three grand, until July 2nd of 2018, when they announced Grey Dawn just came out. Out, motherfucker! The Kickstarter would go silent for three years. In the interim, a studio called Carbon, which refer to themselves as a games incubator slash accelerator, offered to fund the game and help out with marketing it. Upon its release, it would receive a number of favorable reviews, but few of these would be from larger, more recognizable publications that people for some reason deem more worthy of their trust. Why would you trust any of them? Why would you trust me? Why would I trust myself? You can't! Oh. Okay. The opening cinematic before this game's title screen is a vague admonishment from a disembodied voice about the punishment for siding with Satan, making it immediately clear why the developer chose to brand their game as a religious horror experience. Grey Dawn seems like it might be relatively straightforward for all but a handful of seconds before making it very clear that the world it presents is one stuck somewhere between a nightmare and purgatory that never really picks a side. And while we can occasionally pick up snippets of memories and past events, the entire the entire game takes place in a surreal and often twisted version of places familiar to the characters. I mean, I'm guessing. I don't really have evidence that there was ever anything other than this. It opens on some variation of Christmas Eve in 1920s England. An orthodox priest named Father Abraham awakes to all manner of curious changes to his house. Blood pours from teapots, frogs rain from the ceiling, and violent, religious-themed visions haunt him. Through a series of comically enthusiastic radio announcements, we learn that a number of children from an orphanage have died, and the police suspect Father Abraham might be responsible. Throughout the course of the game, the priest explores different areas of his home, while occasionally being brought to a far less unsettling realm that is perhaps some representation of heaven, with beautiful scenery, dreamlike physics, and children running about. In these moments, he is guided by the voice of David, an altar boy who is missing, to uncover bits of his past and the locations of eight portraits he wants you to collect. During the back and forth to these different realities or planes of existence, Father Abraham tries to better understand the events that led him here. What drove a wedge between him and a former lover? What was his role in the deaths of these children? What happened to David? Was he possessed by a demon or was he the second coming so to speak? All the while being confronted and accused of all manner of sinful behavior at every turn. We are given a lot of jumbled pieces of the story, and rarely given enough pieces to have a clear, coherent view of it. It really feels like you are sifting through misdirection and conjecture in order to find more solid facts. You get a, a fantastic feel for the oppression and guilt for his perceived role in some of these children's death, in his meandering from faith and dabbling in the occult even. Mostly the dead children thing though. This game does not shy away from the reality of child death. There's even a subplot where you have to free the souls of unbaptized children. It's probably the most dead kids I've seen since. I didn't even write anything after this. It's, it's just a blank. There's no- The depiction of a traditional Romanian funeral is one of the more sobering moments in the gauntlet of supernatural visions. Its ritual is just plainly depicted with no supernatural interruption. The darker experiences he has put through in his home are mostly informed by Catholic guilt, but elsewhere in the more peaceful plane, salvation or spiritual fulfillment is expressed by a number of beliefs, like Buddhism, Judaism, and Egyptian polytheism. The book The Little Prince is also frequently referenced and winds up being a thematic bookend. I mean quite literally it just drops like a paragraph length quotation. Much of the imagery is Eastern Orthodox Catholic, but then you'll take part in a puzzle that employs alchemy or some other heretical or mystical concept expressed in the same language, and I found myself really charmed by it all. Father Abraham goes through the game using his faith and his, look I want to say priest skills, to overcome these perceived obstacles. Initially I was unsure I could get into this concept. 
What would I be able to relate to or empathize with? I don't have faith in anything. Not a deity, not myself. I'm a rationalist, which is why I only believe in astrology. The still pending Nibiru Cataclysm. The Bermuda Triangle. The fact that we are living on a hollow earth. Body memory. Crop circles. Extraterrestrials. Interdimensional beings. Reptilians. Chemtrails. Flying rods. Mothman. Wendigo. Ghosts. Ghost dogs. Ghost orbs. Phantoms. EVP. Palmistry. And, uh, yeah, maybe making a wish in a fountain, you know, you throw a little coin in there. There are some obvious plot points and enough moments to hint that the story is probably more of a psychological allegory, that we are experiencing the internal torment and guilt of a man who filters these feelings through what he can comprehend, what makes sense to him, his spirituality. As is the case with most examples of the maybe magic, maybe mundane trope, this is the side of the story I'm going to lean towards, the one that's going to resonate with me. The idea that a priest could regress into fantasy so fully as a result of trauma and is punishing himself with his religion is kind of beautiful in a sad way. When we have these somber moments where we feel reality sort of slip through the cracks, I, f I felt them, I felt something. This is how I can appreciate the plot of Grey Dawn, through the lens of non-belief, where real, tangible, tragic events happened beneath whatever supernatural speculation is thrown on top. Unfortunately, I'm not fond of the creator's attempt at injecting horror into the story. There is clear love and effort put into the depiction of Eastern Orthodox Catholicism, the parts of this game where that is the focus, where we are taking part in the ritual, are carefully handled. I didn't find it preachy or boring or any of the feelings I usually reserve for such things. It's just unfortunate that these ideas have to share a stage with goofy satanic panic elements like pentagrams, the Petron Cross, possessed dolls, the number 666, and I tried to justify this in my head, like, you know, this is his spiritual journey. We are in his thoughts, so the things that might frighten him may be quaint things like this, but that doesn't make their inclusion effective. If their presence was also to unnerve the player, it was a complete failure on that account. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who retains a visceral fear over such benign imagery. It's really odd how effective this game can be on an emotional front, but be so tone deaf when it comes to horror. I'm not someone who is difficult to unnerve. I live in a state of constant, disassociated existential dread at, at any moment I could wake up to the mechanical life support hamster wheel that my frail, worm-like form truly exists within. Yeah, what the fuck was that? Hello, police? Hello? Someone there? Alright, well, that wasn't entirely a comforting exchange. Let's be honest, religion is sort of inherently terrifying. Well, that might not be so for a lot of people, but I feel like it wouldn't be hard to draw some unsettling visions from religious text. People are always, you know, getting their livers eaten by bees or some bizarre shit like that. It could be anything. There's so, there's so much, I'd imagine. So much more than this. There are two endings you can get. And since one is acquired by collecting all of the portraits, you could say one is the good ending and one is the bad ending. But I think they cleverly get away with having one true ending that you get either way. And collecting the portraits or not determines which vague closing monologue you get. Whichever one you get, it, it's a real bummer. A lot of these short form indie horror games give me a very particular feeling that I don't quite have a name for. It's like when a really big, ambitious, creative idea is pared down so much by financial limitations or time constraints that it becomes so vague and amorphous that the only card left to play is to hope there is power in how incomplete it is. It doesn't have to answer a third of the questions, but it needs to sound like it's not important that it does. Does that make sense? It's like it's trying its very best to be something more than a tech demo, more than an experiment, but it never quite gets there, and not having the means to see its original idea through, they throw an idea at you, and hope that that sticks for someone. I felt that a bit with Grey Dawn, and similar fare like Assemblance, the Fidelio Incident, Husk, and Left Alone. It's an ending, that's for sure. It's another situation that sort of frustrates me because I see so much promise in it. On paper, I should have left this game feeling creeped out and sad. My favorite mixture of emotions. And instead, I'm left with some nameless, unfulfilled feeling that is more or less what I would call normal. Grey Dawn will no doubt be referred to as a walking simulator, due to its emphasis on walking, 
while being guided by a voice. But it is not void of interaction and puzzles. They aren't cruelly difficult or poorly telegraphed, so it's unlikely that your progress would be impeded by them a great deal. Most of them involve working out arcane chemistry sets or machinery, but you will most likely already have any items that need to be implemented, and you'd probably figure out which knob to twist or button to push by trial and error. It feels like you're doing something, that's for sure, but often without much instruction or information to tell you why you're doing it, and what will be accomplished by you doing it. This led to a weird feeling I I had that never actually paid off, where I just kind of felt like I was being manipulated. Like maybe the voices in heaven were really the demons, playing a dang ass trick on me, and this whole time I've been a puppet under their control, enacting some satanic coup without knowing. Maybe that was the point, maybe they're fucking with me, maybe they got in my head, maybe, maybe they're still in there, maybe I'm crazy. You're not! I'm not? Nope. Okay. <laughs> If you've played anything that Frictional Games has put out, then a lot of the mechanics will be familiar to you. Opening doors and drawers requires you to click and drag to operate them. Ordinarily I appreciate this mechanic, but it felt a little rougher than say Soma or Amnesia. On my second playthrough I just used a controller which bypasses those elements. Since there isn't much in the way of variation or optional activities, I didn't feel like Grey Dawn is a game that really benefits from repeat playthroughs. It says everything it needs to say the first time, and collecting all the portraits to get the good ending didn't feel satisfying. Beyond the abundance of cliché and lack of gameplay depth, there are, again, a number of really creative and fun ideas. When I had first watched the trailer, I was immediately captivated by the music box mechanic. During certain moments in the Heavenly Realm, Father Abraham has a music box that, when he cranks it, moves him to a different place in time, where the season has changed and different parts of the area are either blocked off or now unblocked. A fantastic idea on its own that could potentially be implemented in some challenging puzzles, but it really winds up being just for show. Winds up. It winds up! <laughs> Laugh. This game constantly flirts with deeper interactivity, but never really commits to one idea. I think a whole game could be centered around the music box idea, but that's just one of the things that happens. It's gotta be tough setting out to make a horror-themed walking simulator. I think for that to be successful, you have to nail the atmosphere and plot, and you can't have zero agency. You need to somehow feel threatened, but that's a bigger, more difficult mystery to unravel. Firewatch did some amazing things with building tension and mystery, uh, until it kind of pisses itself for the sake of realism or something. It, maybe that's just me, but uh, I, I'm never gonna be satisfied with an anti-climax, especially when everything that came before it, like, f anything could happen. Anything could happen and it would be infinitely better than nothing. I could read a million articles in favor of that ending saying how how it's it, it resonates and it's a uh, it's emotionally effective and it's this this critique of escapism everybody's uh, escaping from something or hiding from some responsibility and you can't hide from responsibility fuck that that's not what a video game should be doing i'm escaping into it right now fuck man Anyway, in the case of Grey Dawn, I'd want tougher, more clearly defined puzzles. I'd want some mechanic that is carried through the entire game. They already have gramophone cylinders you can find that reveal some of the plot, but there's only like five or so of them. I hate any time a game has me assemble a torn up piece of paper. Uh, there are these almost fun little collect the bits to build a thing segment. Uh, that could be more interesting. Nice! You made a child's coffin. We're all proud of you. I just want more. You're showing me that you want more than nothing, but it's an awkward jumbled amount. I'm trying to meet this game halfway, but it doesn't know what it wants. It's like I tell myself in the mirror every morning, just commit to something, figure it out. There isn't much time. I'm developing this new thing where my eyelid starts twitching incessantly and I Googled it and I guess it's mainly caused by stress, fatigue and caffeine. So I guess I'm just gonna have to live with this now. Grey Dawn is an interesting looking game. It is inconsistently gorgeous and shoddy looking. Certain environments and effects and assets look expertly crafted, and I lost count of how many times I entered a room and just froze to take in the spectacle of it all. When I'd pick up items, no matter how mundane, I would just flip them over and just keep looking around at them and all the detail and the intricacy of their textures. Adding all this detail to these displays of orthodox iconography is really a sight to behold, because every little 
whole thing is so ornate and extravagantly decorated. Despite the uneasy feeling that religion often makes me feel, I can't deny that there is a great deal of beauty to its spiritual bric-a-brac. It's relics like tinctures and reliquaries. Even in the architecture of Slavic and Romanian churches, they are so grand and colorful with those onion-ass domes on top. It's all so extravagant and magical looking, and I think it was a really smart move setting it during the holidays, so it clashes even harder with how dark the game can be. The developers certainly know how to paint a scene. Unfortunately, there are some undercooked, rudimentary looking assets that can be distracting. Character models are often obscured or hidden in some way because they aren't very impressive, and more often you will be interacting with dolls or mannequins. Things that you wouldn't really question their bland appearance because they aren't human. Most of the time. And not all of the design choices are that inspired. Entering the library reveals that Abraham's collection has been replaced with thousands of copies of one book titled Death of God. It's something that only makes me wonder, did you just not want to go through the hassle of designing a library? Did it seem easier to just make it all one book and have it be a spooky thing? I don't know if it's a spooky thing. Maybe if you filled it with a bunch of shitty Instagram poetry books, it would actually be really unsettling. I'd walk in there and I'd be like, I, I gotta get the fuck out of here right now. I found a lot to appreciate visually in this game. Voice acting is not great. Father Abraham has a pleasant accent and a nice timbre to his voice. My indispensable addiction. But the performance is sort of emotionless. <laughs> don't cry, woman. Some voices are too campy. Why do you think I'm standing so close to the room of your sins? And the rest are children's voices. And I mean, you get what you get with a child performer. Who is Alexander? He's my brother. I don't want to speak about him right now. Some memories bring back pain. Uh, excuse me, but uh, little tight, could you, uh, could, could you? Could you back up off that mic? There is near constant music featured throughout the game, but it is mostly short tracks that loop until you leave an area, and they can become sort of grating if you stick around one place too long. What I was more impressed with was the music that plays on different radios, much of it Christmas music, and I'm guessing they are public domain or something, but they prove to be incredibly eerie and atmospheric. It's that old raggedy washed out recording, it's just brutal. Sometime in 2016, Interactive Stone uploaded a part teaser and part mood piece to YouTube called Fields of Desolation, which is still a fantastic video, but it paints the game as being much more atmospheric than it turned out. I'm assuming this was when the goals they had set were far loftier, and they probably had to settle for what they could get. But visually, it's still such a dreamy game. In writing this, I was listening to music while my playthrough footage was just on loop, and pair it with almost anything and it immediately becomes a surreal music video. Motherfucker, I said, I said almost anything. I think this is a really interesting game from a developer with promise. Right out of the gate, they are depicting a culture that is not often seen in video games, but really should be. They are also going all out with depicting religion, something that I've never really appreciated. Shown positively or critically, or some watered down place in the middle like Far Cry 5, it's not done anything for me but I think this was closer to something I might appreciate. Maybe because it's approached from an emotional, psychological, personal point of view. All right, we're really going for it this time, guys. We're putting all our money together. We're gonna make a video game. First idea, I want religion. I want dead kids. Put it in Romania, more religion, more dead kids. If you could picture religion and dead kids as a, uh, like a little slider, slide both of those. Max them out! It's bold! It's an incredibly ambitious first outing, but one that shows that there is still progress to be made, and the failure of its Kickstarter may have profoundly affected the finished product. For a lot of the time, I was engaged in this story, but I feel like it cuts out too short with a lot of ideas that were very interesting not fully explored. And there are some concepts that are just really uh, generic and not my cup of tea. It's filled with a lot of ideas, some of which go over my head. So it left me with this kind of bittersweet feeling where I wanted to unravel everything, I wanted to know everything, but I, I can never really know if I did or not. Either way, there are some legitimately powerful images here. I remember being taken aback by one instance where you look through a glass door at a bunch of children laughing and playing, and then, ah, oh, I don't even know how I feel, but it made me feel something. 
I didn't expect to be so impressed and captivated by religious iconography, but this game does a fantastic job of making a beautiful spectacle out of it. So much so that all the Satan business, which is ordinarily my jam, looks a little juvenile, not quite as capably handled. Overall though, a visual treat, but it's a shame the same amount of care wasn't put into voice acting or music. I have issues with the inconsistency of its gameplay, but Individually, there are some fun activities, and I really enjoyed exploring each new area and just being constantly surprised by where it went. I didn't think I would be riding in a sleigh with flying reindeer or shoving a blessed fetus in a jar into a demon's stomach thing, but hey, life takes you crazy places. I hope these guys keep making games because they have a lot of big ideas, a lot of heart, a lot of originality, um, but seriously, don't make me put together a torn up piece of paper because I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not gonna do it anymore! I hate it! I'll cut my f***ing arm off! Judging by the reviews on Steam, the game seems to have found its audience, so hopefully they will be emboldened to continue, and their next project is a bigger success. They deserve money. Ha- ooh. I, th I thought I heard like a phone ringing, but I guess it was nothing. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, hey, speaking of money, <laughs> consider supporting me on Patreon. If you're already a supporter, I appreciate you a great deal. I don't have a cool little explanation for that, like you're keeping, you know, the wheels turning over here. You're keeping my staff paid. No, it's just me, and I like having, you know, a roof and the occasional jack-in-the-box taco. So anything that keeps uh, allowing me to focus time on this uh, is amazing. I'm incredibly thankful for because here's the deal, I'm an idiot, I'm a dummy. You know, I could focus uh, more time on trying to find a, a real job. And you know, not toil away my time on part-time work where I uh, am miserable and do nothing but daydream about what I'm gonna work on when I get home. I could be a big boy, I could grow up, but I don't want to. So help me out if you want, and uh, you know, I can have more time to uh, make this shit. I'm very glad somebody wants to watch it, though. Again, thank you to anybody who supports, or even just thank you to anybody who has watched anything I've made in the past year. I, it's, I started out the year with, like, half of what I have now, and I'm at, like, 6,000 subscribers, and that's crazy. I don't know why I said it with that inflection, that's just how it came out, but it's really uh, unbelievable to me. So thank you again, and special thanks to Mr. Horrible for uh, gifting me the game on Steam, because you know, ya boy can't afford SHIT! I can't afford it! Anyway, thanks to everybody for giving me, you know, the, a glimmer of hope that I'm not um, as much of an idiot, I'm not as much of a complete failure, there's something to what I'm doing uh, that could be worth spending time on. So have a nice uh, winter solstice and uh, do whatever. Ooh, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> thank you for watching my video. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for uh, donating on Patreon. I've said all I need to say. I will see you later. 9-11 was an inside job.